things. What would you tell them what it means to be impeccable with your words? Well, to me, well, that's a different way. It's like when, when they decide to ask me, I, I, I usually, the way I teach the, the tradition to them is just by living it. And if they ask, they, I'll answer. But to be impeccable with the word first, symbol, whose definition is subject to only different to other people. They may be spelled the same way, but they may be words with different definitions. So if you become aware that a word has its meaning by an agreement, to be impeccable with yourself, you can also be say, be impeccable with your intent with, to the words. Okay. And your words have power because you're alive to give them power. So to be impeccable with the word, you can simplify it this way. To be impeccable with the word is to love myself unconditionally through my word, to see myself as I am. To use it not impeccably is to use my word to love myself conditionally, to conditional love and domesticate myself with it. So you can use those two contrasts. To be impeccable with the word is to love myself, which allows me to love everyone as they are. Exactly. So to me, that's to be impeccable with the word. Oh, that, that's, uh, it sounds like uh, when I was growing up, my father, he was very, very strong when it comes to what we would say uh, to the, because it's a lot of siblings, and we would have to be, uh, you know, courteous with our words. Even to our older siblings, he didn't want us to call them by their full name. You would have to say brother this and sister, because he do believe that how you, being impeccable with your word is a form of respect too. Now, how do you uh, say to someone on the next chapter, don't take anything personal? Oh, yeah. To me, not taking it personal is very simple. I only control to the tips of my fingers. I don't control your perception, nor do I control your will. To not take things personal simply means I do not assume responsibility for anyone else's will, nor their perception. I control my will, I control my perception. In the same way that when I say a word, I'm both right and wrong at the same time. I'm right to the people who agree with me, and I'm wrong to the people who disagree with me. But the reason why that is is because I don't control the perception of another individual. They do. So what do I control? I control the integrity and clarity of what I say. Personal simply means that just as words have power because I give them power. People can say things to me with that negativity, but it's my responsibility whether or not I accept that negativity. So you can say that there's a quote that I thoroughly enjoy which goes by, no one can make me feel inferior without my consent. To not take things personally is realizing not to give that consent to words that make me feel inferior. And that also includes my words with myself. So to not take things personal is simply to respect myself, to know that I'm the one who gives power to words, and I'm also the one that gives permission to words to impact me. And I say words because words are very powerful. Exactly. And it's, it's just expression of someone's will and intent. So, uh -huh. like Buddha, Siddhartha, who doesn't give permission to, the ro to those arrows to hurt him, he turns them into roses. Uh huh. That's how I see you, it almost it, it almost sounds like um, what I would say to someone. It's not important uh, what you think about me. It's important what I think about myself. Yes. And and I think and that's, and that's, and that's the root. Yes. And that is the root because or I and I my my mentor uh, one of my mentors would say I live and I move in my and God's being. So it's all falls under that. It is doesn't mm -hmm. important what you think about me. It's what don't take anything personal. Wonderful. Yeah. So, also, it's um, how, it's how I use those words on myself. Yes. <laughs> it's how it's how I use those words against me or against myself. So you can say no. So being impeccable with the word and don't make assumptions go hand in hand. Yes, they they. Oh, sorry, not taking things personal. Sorry, not taking things personal. Go hand in hand. So and the book when he said no assumption, you might be in a mall. I think if I don't, uh, I'm quoting him, and so you may see at someone, let's say a woman, and and um, 
comes at you and you may think that they're trying to maybe pick you up as a woman and it might be that you know you're assuming things do not assume and we have a culture of always assuming things uh, we always assuming this or and is assuming a part of judgmental what would you say to that I would say it's, it has an element of judgment but a judgmental word but I like the way that there's no principle of closure I like to use that as an example if you draw a circle and you don't draw, draw the, the last part the mind has the capacity to fill in that piece of, uh, of the circle if I draw two sides of a triangle and I don't draw that third line, the mind has a capacity to project that missing line. The reason is, is that the mind has a desire to know the full story, to know the truth, of the, to know the decisions based on what we know. Or you can say, we make decisions based on what we see in our environment. So our mind has a capacity to project onto things or people the whole story. So we know one side of the truth, then we know the other side of the truth. But if we are missing this part that connects the whole image, then we begin to project onto it. Now we can do that with objects. That's why people create abstract art. In literature, we call it reading between the lines or the power of suggestion. In our own lives, we project meaning to people's actions. We project meaning to certain action or behavior or things said to make it feel like we know the whole story, but it's our own projection. We then let life actually show us the truth. It's like the example I like to say, for example, I, I, like, I like to tell the story. It's a fictional story based on truth. Imagine me at the age of 23 and my ex-girlfriend girlfriend with me, but I'm young and I start dating someone else and we start living together. And we start having certain little habits, like she calls me up at seven o'clock in the evening when she gets out of work. So that happens. So one side of the triangle, I, I know her and her habit. The other line, imagine that she didn't call one night. So the part I'm missing is why hasn't she called? And her mind starts creating all these ideas. She's still at work. She's driving and she doesn't want to drive when call when she's driving. She's with her girlfriend. She, she's with another guy. <gasps> she's with another guy. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> An emotional reaction already happened. All of a sudden, in the middle of that reaction, as I get angry, the door opens and she goes, Surprise! I got you your favorite food, which is Thai food. But I don't see that. I only start seeing what I think and I call oh, you little. And then years later, I'm talking to a therapist saying, Every girlfriend asks me for another guy. And it's this one. And when I tell the story, and when I reach the point where she comes in with the things of food in her hands, she actually asks me, What is that in her hands? Oh, it's Thai food. <laughs> she didn't call me because she was wanting to surprise me with my favorite meal. So there's a fifth story. Um, Had my mind or my heart been helpless, if um, all, if none of them was because she hasn't called because she wanted to surprise me with my favorite meal, then all of them disappear. But if one of them was, then she was. Stories disappears, and this potential truth becomes the truth, or you can say this assumption becomes the truth. The truth. So an assumption simply is a story or an idea that we project onto something when we don't know the full story. And, 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 and that causes a lot of um, unhealthy relationships, I would say, mm -hmm. whether it's yeah. through it um, uh, social interaction, family members, if you, you we make so much assumptions, if we were to cut back on that, I think we would have a much more healthier society. Well, you can say that a lot of the wounds we may have in our emotional body is created by assumptions. You know, you can say that we, we get hurt because we believe them. That's the danger of making an assumption is that we believe them. And when we believe them, we take an action. And in that action, we get hurt. So, can, so I like to change that. Like, instead of don't make an assumption, an easier way to practice this one is don't they're your creation. Letting know, giving, having the patience to life teaching us or showing us what the truth is, to ask questions, allows us to prevent us, one importantly, from taking action on them. And that's where a lot of our suffering happens. So yeah. it's assumptions, but it's because the mind, it has a natural tendency to fill in the gap. Oh, wow.
interesting because um and i would leave it there because uh you can you, that will take a whole day to talk about the types of assumptions because um at the end of the day everyone does some form of knowingly or knowingly deliberately it's just as a part of the culture or who we are now someone listening to this would be fascinated and the next part that i like how do you define doing your doing the best that you can well to me the way i define it is by enjoying life to me this is the expression of uh, the agreement of unconditional love the willingness to see myself as i am for example yesterday i ran a half marathon that uh 21 kilometers i believe wow and a, a half marathon wow. so i ran it in two hours and 12 minutes that's you know that's uh, fast for me um but today I, w- i went for a run trying to get some of that lactic acid off my my legs and i could barely run three miles because my i was hurt you know? so okay doing my best is always being willing to see myself as i am today today i can't really walk too well because I ran 13 miles yesterday and yesterday I was able to run that because I trained several weeks for that and my best what I'm going to do and I'm going to do my best with what I can who I am what I am is the energy that animates this body the best way to describe it is in order for an object to move there needs to be a force that moves that object I am the force that moves this body. I am the force that moves this mind. I am not this body, I am not this mind because when when I give my last breath or my last heartbeat, I don't take this body with me nor this mind. But what I am is I am the force that gives life to both this body and this mind, which means I am the whole. This is me. To do my best is to live. To use the effort, the energy to move my legs, to move my arms, to create a thought that gives it power. That's why my love is alive because I'm allowed to give it power. That's why my agreements and my beliefs have power, my work has power because I'm allowed to give it power. To always do my best is to sit I, I like that. Engage life because sometimes some people do their best for others. It's really for yourself because uh, we always trying to please someone other than ourselves and because it's for some of us mm-hmm. what is it that is your yeah. best and as we say it's a difference between i have to and i want to you can say the main problem is the four agreements confront is domestication a system of reward and punishment by which we model the behavior of an individual if we live up to the expectation we're worthy of love and if we don't live up to the expectation then we're worthy of the punishment so we well, that's the main problem that the that the four agreements faces and what domestication is is judging myself rejecting myself for example the telltale sign that i'm using the four agreements as an instrument of domestication is judging myself for not taking things personal or sorry judging myself for taking things personal judging myself for not being a part of power judging myself for for making that assumption at that moment that we use the four agreements as the four conditions now i'm using them to love myself conditionally i love myself if If I live up to the image of Domingo Ruiz Jr., who is always does his best, always does, is not in fact, he is, he is in fact, what's the word, doesn't make assumptions. Ah, I forgot the fourth of you, I don't know, how can I call myself Domingo Ruiz Jr.? <laughs> <laughs> a diatribe of judgment, judging myself for not living up to the image of perfection. So you can say, the function of ego is to keep that illusion alive, to keep that model, that image of, Dom, in my case, Domingo Ruiz Jr., If I want to be worthy of love, then I have to be the perfect Tommy Gell Reese Jr. Oh. That is an illusion. That It is, is an illusion. I agree with you. I am rejecting myself based on an image that doesn't exist. But if I live up to it, I'm worthy of love. And if I don't live up to it, I'm worthy of the rejection. So, to always do your best is to let go of our domestication. In fact, that's the whole four agreements, to let go of our domestication and bring that healing, to heal the wounds that conditional love left in our life by using our word to love ourselves unconditionally. Yes. To let go of the assumptions that I've created that support my conditional love. 
to let go of the power of, I'm given to people to domesticate me and to always do my best, which to me simply means I am alive. And while I'm alive, anything is possible and I can't give what I do not have. Exactly. Which means even though I do this to heal myself, I am a member of this community. And as a member of this community, I choose to give what I have, which is yes. unconditional love. I am the constant in every relationship I have. If I have conditional love for myself, you then I have nothing but conditional and, love And you're give. absolutely right. You cannot give what you don't have. That said, I'm Don Jr. You know, I'm, I am so excited how you explain yourself. When I first heard that, I must commend, I have my cousin, Melissa, who gave me that book two years ago. I never... You know, she gave me the Christmas gift and I never looked at it until this past Christmas. And it was the uh, best thing. I tell everybody that's my Bible. I used to have another book uh, but as my Bible. And I really like how you explain. Uh, I can tell that you're coming. You're definitely a product of your dad. But I see that you've written your own book. And I want uh, your thoughts and that. Explain the, the mystery of self, mastery of self. Well, to me, the master of self is putting all these instruments into practice. You can say it's the moment where I stop pretending to, to be something I am not, and I begin to see myself as I am. This is who I am. I am the sum of every decision I've ever made. Every yes and every no I've given in my life has brought me to this moment. But at the same time, I'm the youngest I will ever be. I have my whole life ahead of me. How do I want to live it? How do I want to engage it? So you can say that, yes, we this inner journey to heal myself, to heal my own wounds, was an inner journey. But now I reach this point where I want to contribute to my community, to contribute to my family, to my friends. How do I engage them? So you can say that it starts with that awareness of self. And from that awareness of self, I'm able to see people as they are, like Don Quixote. Don Quixote only wants to see what he wants to see, so he only sees himself as a mask, which means he's totally projecting Dulcinea as he wants to see her. That's what conditional love does. It doesn't let me to see who people are. It only lets me see what I want to see, or at least what conditional love wants to see. But as I begin to practice and I take off this mask and I see myself as I am, in Don Quixote's case, to see himself as Alonso Quijano, or Quijones, depending on which edition you read, is to see myself as this living being that has the full potential to go in any direction in life. Once I'm able to see myself as that, I'm able to take off the mask of other people. In, in Don Quixote's case, to take off the mask of Tucinea and see who the woman she is. Which oh. allows me to take off the mask because of my mom and see the woman that she is. Take off the mask of my wife and see the woman that she is. Take off my daughter's mask and see the woman she is. And I see them for who they are. Exactly. And allows me rather to know than how once to again engage. going back to making assumptions, once again that yeah. calls into play because you once you take exactly. off that mask, you're able to not make any assumption because you're seeing their true self. And that said, yes. I would what you would say to the Guyanese, the average Guyanese before we close, how to live that purposeful, full life. What would you uh, in summing up what you've just said? Which to me, it's about enjoying life. So know the difference between I have to and I want to. Because when, you, when, you see it, when I say I want to, it's from passion. You know, you can say conditional love says, if I live up to this image, then I'm worthy of love and I'll do everything to live up to that image. But once I have that, that carrot, once I have that love, in which direction do I want to go? In which direction do I want to share? That's passion. What motivates me to create life is a passion for life, a passion for to be in relationships with the people I love, with my father, with my brother, with my mother, with my son, with my daughter, with my wife, with my friends, with my neighbors, with the people in our community, with you right now. Yeah, we, we try our best to have this interview before and because my son came at the wrong, uh, at, at the time he came in, we had to postpone it, but we still kept trying, we still kept trying and here we are and we're in engaged and that's the beauty of life. Sometimes life gives us an obstacle, but because we want to manifest it and create it, we find a way until we get, life gives us the opportunity to be here. That's what life is. To enjoy, by enjoying being you, which you with everyone in your life. 
and being in sync with everyone. Well, I thank you for this interview. I hope the Guyanese people, when I share this interview with them, will appreciate and start living that fulfilled life and that happy life and take off the mask and start loving self. I thank you. But before you go, there's one other question I wanted to find out about. The, the I think it's the culture Toltec. Could you, what is that? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. In a brief. Sure. The word, the word Toltec is a Nahuatl word that means artist in English. Nahuatl is a Mesoamerican language before Columbus in the, the, the Americas, at least to the Mexica. So Toltec, if I translate the phrase, the Toltec art of transformation into 100% English, it means the artist type of transformation. I am an artist and the canvas for my work of art is my life. And that work of art is constantly changing, constantly moving. It's either the most beautiful image of harmony or the most perfect nightmare. But it's always moving, it's always changing. So you can say Toltec, as a philosophy, as a tradition, is allowing life to be the teacher. And we learning from life. So how we apply those teachings, how we apply it, is to engage life, to learn to use these instruments that allows me to heal myself and to heal the relationship with other people and to enjoy life to the fullest. fullest sorry, that has it that, that got there. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, you've taught me so much today and I like how you've explained yourself. I can so you're coming from a wonderful place. I am I am truly, truly excited that you were able and, and I know it's something new for the Guyanese. Uh, people and thank you, thank you for taking the time out. I will certainly oh, be in touch. Well, do check us out. Thank we you. have LadyWendyShow.com on our website, and you can read a little bit more about us. And I thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. hey.